Uh, hello and welcome to the Cinnabums podcast. Um, it's summer, uh, and as Chris Rock says in Pootie Tang, it's a hot one out there. Um, and it's a hot one in here. I'm Luke Mueller, and as always, I'm with uh, the delicious John Nuring. Um, hello. I mean, look at him, folks. He's like a New York bagel with cream cheese. Just covered in schmear. Yeah, that's... <laughs> with some locks and some yeah. <laughs> other Jewish delicacies. Yes, oh yeah. Uh, for those who can't get enough of politics, um, please check out our Star Wars commentary episode. I think you'll find a number of similarities between that and Joe Biden in the presidential debate. Um, but I, I will They're say... Both equally coherent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I will say that doing a Star Wars commentary um, where you pretend you don't know anything about it uh, where you pretend you don't know anything about the most famous movie that's ever existed, I think is much tougher than a presidential debate. Yes. Yeah. You can lie your way through a, a debate really easily, but to lie your way through Star Wars commentary acting as if you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's well, you no saw all those test. rules at the beginning of CNN, uh, like yeah. that they post, right? The, all those rules. Uh, we don't. <laughs> we, we were just on going. Yeah. You know, we're live the whole time. Some like Trump said was kept. He he said that like really made me laugh is when he said uh, he said everything was rocking good <laughs> when he's talking about his <laughs> his <laughs> his time as a president. <laughs> Yeah, it's which uh, I think is a ridiculous thing to say about um m anything. Like I don't, I don't, I would never say that about my own life, about like <laughs> the morning I've been having. Much less the running the a country as big as the United States. <laughs> to say that everything was rocking good. He t he talks in such weird like uh, I don't know is the colloquialism is that the word but it, like he has these weird like phrases that he just throws out all the time like he's, yeah. he's very he's like a thespian like he's the likes of which we've never seen before like he says these yeah, grandiose yeah. phrases yeah. about things he like, just has his he has his um just his uh phrases down yeah. um yeah and and he's living in his own he's living in his own world for sure yeah but um his like his supporters like love like love his like lines you know what i mean like yeah 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 they they, they eat that up and he knows it too so that's why he, he it doesn't even like that's the thing it doesn't even really matter like the actual things he's saying but that he sounds like confident and uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. everything while he's while he's doing yeah. it. It's, yeah, <laughs> and then of course, as soon as Biden has like that raspy voice, you know, they're like, okay, this is all they're going to talk about now is how he's like, right? Which it, he didn't. I Biden didn't do that great. Not that I really watched the whole thing, but yeah. uh, I think a tree yeah, would have probably done better than Biden. I think a tree could have beaten Trump, but yeah, you can't yeah. have a a dying man up there either. I was thinking that Biden should um, definitely start buying those twelve packs of yerba mates for his his <laughs> debates. Yeah, that would liven him up a bit. Yeah, or it would, you know, do something else to him. Uh, <laughs> the opposite of liven him up. Which, Maybe at like eighty you know? eighty years plus, you can't drink yerba mate anymore. Yeah. I don't know. I think I, I think yerba mate is uh, it's a young a young man's drink too. It like, is, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, like I don't know. I might have to watch it into when I get in my forties. It might be my last. My thirties might be my last run with it. Yeah, enjoy it while you can, because uh, yeah, it's it's definitely not. Your for doctor the, uh... might be eventually telling you that. <laughs> Your heartbeat sounds like a house track or something like that. Yeah, yeah. You can't keep your uh, your same twenty five year old heart uh, going for for eternity. Yeah. 
But I will tell you, if I had one for debate before debate, I would like uh, I'd be very confident up there because, yeah. man, they make me very, very confident. I feel like I could, uh, you know, wrestle a pack of wolves when I'm on your mate. <laughs> It is kind of true. It does give you a different caffeine high than coffee or tea. Like I've been at yeah. work before and really just like, so like, oh my God, just get me out of here. I want to get home and all this stuff. And I'll have like an afternoon yerba mate. And then, <laughs> and then all of a sudden I'm like the office guy that's like going up to everybody and joking <laughs> around. And yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, is that a new dress, <laughs> Sally? Wow. That's looking great. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> it really does change you yeah. you're like what i would never <laughs> even notice a dress usually yeah. besides that i'm like oh god get your stupid dress out of my office yeah get your so dress just... <laughs> yeah yeah like i feel like i recognize say um the falseness of coffee um you know what i mean like yeah. where I, I recognize it's making me more talkative and confident but i recognize the um falseness i realized that this is just you know something that's doing when your yerba mate when i drink yerba mate i like believe it you know yeah. what i mean it's like a drug i'm like this is who i am i'm like yeah. this all the time <laughs> i'm a it's creative like, genius I am, yeah, yeah 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 it's like you just like jumped out of the matrix or um jumped in into the matrix i don't know yeah. what the phrase is but yeah, it's a, it's kind of a nice it's nice to be like disconnected from reality uh like that. <laughs> Your coffee's sure. a little more grounded. Yeah. No for pun sure. intended. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know for sure. So that, maybe that's just what Biden needs just to for like a, a debate or two. That's all I'm saying. Just like a yerba mate shot, like a espresso yerba yeah, mate. Yeah. Just a yeah. little bit. All he needs all you need is just a little a hint and it, it gets you you know, they don't need they definitely don't need to sell them in such big quantities either i would say oh no i actually started uh well because of the grocery store i go to they had a deal on like uh it was like two for four of the sparkling ones and i started to get oh, yeah. those and i was like this is a much better size yeah because <laughs> i find myself like i don't even finish the big ones a lot of times now because i'm like this is oh, almost, really? this is too much I think the uh, normal yerba mates are so um, big and strong that um, I tend to hold off having them as often as I'd like, you know, because I yeah. know what it'll. I know the um, the power of it. So yeah, when you can feel your heart beating, that is when you probably need to take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Here yeah. I go. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> when there is literally like your skin is like popping out a little bit that's when you know you need to take it easy on the yeah on the no, yeah i would be i would be hosting at a restaurant and i'd be like all right let's get them set yeah. all right a5 let's please go, let's guys. go let's go all right yeah. all right hi reservation all right no, <laughs> five, right this way go 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 uh, yeah, yeah no i don't have a table right now <laughs> <laughs> oh nice dress <laughs> <laughs> um so today on uh the podcast we're going to be talking a little bit about um the documentary that the hbo documentary that literally just came out i think like it's not even out yet quiet on set um no one knows about it yet either yeah. we're gonna be talking about that um we have an exclusive with that yeah yeah because we've been doing things lately we're a little behind on just covering uh recent events considering we uh did our star wars commentary that was at least um a couple months of preparation went involved in that, and we had to employ um, a lot of researchers in order to get that episode done. And a lot of there's a lot of copywriting um, issues um, that went into place. Um, so now we're a little bit in, uh, we're scraping away. We're in a, actually in a little bit in some, uh, like a lot of other studios and production companies, we're in some debt um, at the moment. Yeah. Uh, so please support us if you can. Um, but we're going to be also talking about uh, Furiosa. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, The Fall Guy. Uh, we're going to be talking about Hitman. Um, and we're going to be talking about uh, J.J. Redick, uh, the, you know, went to the Lake Lakers as a head coach. And so that uh, got John and I thinking and we'll uh, 
we'll tell you what that how how that might have inspired us uh mm, yeah 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 and john you had some uh uh some stuff you wanted to talk about as well right well yeah we got some uh we got some you know comedy special you know everyone has a comedy special out these days it seems like but you know we got some we got some ones that maybe you've maybe you've heard of maybe you haven't um but yeah yeah we got these are some uh more obscure uh comedy specials you know it's not just some so the guy. indie the indie art house of comedy specials yes this is got. this is the a24 of comedy specials <laughs> It's not Tom Segura going up there and talking about poor people and his kids. And yeah, I don't know. These are like your favorite alt comedians, favorite alt comedians. Um, wow. Yeah. yeah so we're going right. deep. We're going deeper than much more deep than the movies we'll be talking about today. Oh, yeah. We're um, we're we're diving in. Yeah. Uh, did you watch uh, any of everybody's in L.A.? Uh, John yeah, I Delaney's- did. I- I watched all of it except for the last episode, I think. Yeah. So I could I couldn't make I haven't made it past the second one just because mm-hmm. I couldn't. I don't know. Like I can't like it's it's I'd... it's background. It's background at best while doing your uh, something. Man. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I I was actually um, we were just talking about this the other day with some people that the one. So the last episode that we watched was the one with Bill Hader and David Letterman which was the only episode that I thought was like Good. entertaining and like <laughs> enough to like keep your attention. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That one was, that one was really fun. And I think, yeah, the rest of them, I would get like the first episode. I was so into the vibe and right, the right. look and the, feel the opening everything. of it. I was like, this is going to be like brilliant. And then he started interviewing people and I was like, Oh no, like this yeah. is, and like everyone's like commenting on it too, uh, like uh, Seinfeld and like I because I've only watched the first two, so it's like Seinfeld and John Stewart were the first like two probably big guests, um, and they were both like, "This is the weirdest show I've ever been on in my yeah. life." And they just like confused the whole time. Yeah, the, it's uh, it was kind of yeah, it was kind of like disappointing because it really just like looked promising and like it was something that I was like, wow, I'm gonna love this. And then yeah, it's once that you get the panel of people that none of it they didn't really like gel together well. And then the yeah. comedians, it's always when you get like, I don't know, there's like a mix of like comedians and regular people, and the comedians are trying way too hard to be funny. Yeah, they're like, like let's around. keep let's keep the show going, you know. Like, yeah, let's let's no, try to make this into weird. something, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think it might have been better if it was just like John Mulaney and then, uh, you know, a couple of like expert people on whatever they wanted to talk about. Where he's kind of like, they have like the straight the straight people, and then he's the funny man, kind of making it funny. I don't know. It was like, especially the episode. I mean, I just brought him up too. And I don't mean I, you know, I don't want to just be super negative in here, but I am not like the biggest fan of Tom Segura, not because I like hate him or anything. I just don't really think he's as funny as he's like now this guy that's doing arenas and stuff. Um, but especially when right. he was like on the panel, like I was like, what is what are some of these people like bringing to the table? Yeah, it's like even like Tom Segura was like sitting there and it clearly it didn't seem like he was comfortable with it or wanted to be there. And it's like, yeah, you're like an entertainer, you know, try to be entertaining. And he was just like yeah. trying to be too cool, I thought. And um, and I don't know if I, this cut me off, too, but like Stavros in that first episode, like he comes in and he's he's like funny and everything. But most of the time he was like sitting off to the side and he's just there and it's just like, okay, so what are these people here? for? It's just, it's too unstructured of a talk show. Yeah. 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 And I think it seemed like John Mulaney wasn't too concerned about, uh, because he, in the beginning too, he's like, we're never doing this again. Like we'll never hit our stride. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah. And he was right. He's kind of right. But, uh, (laughs) Yeah, I like the I like the idea of it. The execution was poor, I thought, though. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I really I, I liked the idea of it, too. I was like, oh, John Mulaney is doing a show about just like L.A. and how weird it is and stuff. I was like, that's great. And then his opening um, monologue as well. Like he had, the first steps of the show, he has like the map of L.A. and he like breaks it down. 
Um, and I was like, this is fantastic, you know, but it's yeah. never like that again after it's like the one like clip memorable clip. I feel like from the show. Yeah. Yeah. I liked, um, Fred Armisen had a, I don't know if it was in one of the episodes you saw, but Fred Armisen had a little thing with like old LA punk rockers. Uh, <laughs> it's like a documentary nice. now ish thing. Kind of. Yeah. It was like, a. he was like moderating like a discussion between them and then they all did a song afterwards and that was kind of fun um and there's a couple other like little gags and and like yeah sketches that they did throughout it that i thought were pretty good but um the yeah, yeah, overall the, was just so random and the sideline uh, people i like too of course but uh mm -hmm, yeah like we're playing like the lakers sideline people yeah i like yeah. that um yeah that's but like there's were, elements of it that were that were fun, yeah, but yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we're gonna transition from that like really s silly thing and most silly things that we talk about to a a thing that you can't really joke about and uh, and not a funny thing at all. Um. Uh, quiet on set. The Nickelodeon documentary that uh covers the um. Uh, terrible environment set by um, uh, writer and producer pioneer of uh, Nickelodeon, Dan Schneider, um, which uh, I think is a very personal thing, probably for both of us uh, being of the age group we are. Um, yeah. And so, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, so I'll start, like I watched this documentary in one sitting. Um, I don't know about you. It was kind of like uh Leaving Netherland, the Michael Jackson one. I just once I turned it on, I couldn't turn it off, and then it made me incredibly disturbed. And like after I was over with it, I just kept thinking about it, and I was incredibly disturbed. Um, and it also made me hate show business. Um, yeah. And the big difference between this one and Leaving Netherland is like I didn't grow up with michael jackson really like you know as part of my pop culture you know but i did grow up with nickelodeon a lot in my household and it was a i will say a big deal for me um yeah like for instance yeah. uh comedic timing was practically introduced to me at times by nickelodeon i remember watching uh a friend came over he put on the amanda show which is also in quiet on set and i'm like and i and i'm like was that my first like exposure to sketches you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> and i think it was like drake bell who plays that like kyle guy or whatever in that one do you remember that sketch i'm talking about kyle yeah he's kind of like, like a california like surfer yeah, he's like guy stoner yeah, yeah california stoner, guy, yeah. <laughs> stoner dude yeah and i just remember like thinking it was the funniest thing ever and that the amanda show in a lot of ways hit for me um as of course did like yeah. uh drake and josh hit for me and i think i even brought this up on the cinnabums like a few years ago like that i was re-watching drake and josh <laughs> <laughs> in my adult life and saying that it holds up um like I was watching it at like age 24 or 25 and being like, this is still hilarious. Like I get why I liked this. Um, so like personally quiet on set definitely like hits harder because um, kind of like the, it has that opening uh, caption where it says, for those who were born at this time, this will ruin your childhood or whatever. It's what everybody watched and it's still like, uh, I don't know, still today, like with friends, whatever, we'll reference something from the Amanda show or um, all that. And uh, yeah, and Drake and Drake and Josh too. So it's like weird to look back on all these like memories of watching these shows and then knowing what was going on behind the scenes. Yeah. And it's, and then of course too, like you said about like hating show business is like that. Um, I can't remember his name, but the guy who went to, prison for um abusing drake bell like he gets out and then starts to work for disney 
Yeah, he like gets right a job at, like, on uh, Sweet Life of Zach and Cody right away, which is another show I watched. Yeah. A lot yeah. of, which is, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I think that's like the most like thing that you get disgusted by is that like nobody is, uh, there's no really justice for any of these people. Like, um, yeah. I think like Dan Schneider is still out there like writing things. Um, not for Nickelodeon, but like he's got like his production company or something. Get sick of people talking about like making cancel culture like such a big thing because it's not like like the people who are actually getting like canceled and back then this like these people are all just sort of not worried about yeah um, yeah ramifications for what they're doing because things didn't happen and now all of a sudden people are being held accountable and then right and like and, why is it a why is it bad to be held accountable for being like shitty you know like yeah. kind of uh how where it shows um he, he's he's like making those two women like share a salary in the writer's room yeah um at the beginning and he's having them like I don't know, do inappropriate things in the writer's room on the desk or something like that. It's just yeah, like, like bend over fuck? and yeah, he, yeah, yeah. There's something about like pretending to be sodomized or something, something like so weird that it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. These are things that like we should uh, we should normalize that this is weird behavior that uh, maybe shouldn't be in an office or workplace. Yeah, like. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's that's the thing. Like people talking about, you can't joke about anything anymore. It's like, no, nah, you can just like, I think you're you just, just like don't have to feedback. be shitty, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're you're allowed to give feedback that you don't like something, and just because someone is uncomfortable or doesn't like what you're doing, that it's, you know, it's not that they're like too sensitive or something. It's just that you're kind of uh, creepy, weird fuck that. Uh, yeah it lacks a lot of uh self-awareness so yeah yeah that's wild that like it happened that like this type of stuff is very a frequent and accepted thing and it's like we're 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 kids during it and if you think about it and i've always actually um i've thought about this uh, a lot we kind of grew up we live like our childhood was during the last time where um I don't know, like there were all these acceptable things um, that are were actually like really shitty. Um, yeah. Because like I remember being a kid and like the things that um, got people would say like in the lunch table or just in the gym locker room or whatever were just so accepted and would so not be okay now. It was like the most like uh, unhinged like everyone would get canceled. Like our entire lunch table would get canceled. Yeah. You know what I yeah. mean? Like even in say like seventh or eighth grade, my whole, whole class, we'd all be canceled. Yeah. <laughs> like everybody. <laughs> and, and it was, and it's not cause like, you know, everyone was like a bad guy necessarily. Maybe some of them were, but it was because, especially as men, Men, like not too long ago, when we were like kids, like say before I went to off to college, where men were allowed to get away with like murder, and had yeah. this like upper hand of like, like we can say, you know, we can say bitch, fag, cunt, whenever we want in like open conversation, and that's like normal because men have been doing it for a long time, and now there's all these like. And I, and what's funny is like I think like people who are still our age because we're in that like in the middle of that transition we're like uh millennials not gen z or something like that are like they're not we're not even that old but like they're confused by um <laughs> like it's like they're an old man already they're confused by um the climate now and that we can't they're like, why can't I say anything more anymore? You know, Trey Parker and Matt Stone said whatever they wanted when I yeah. grew up and they were just funny. They were just being funny. It's like, you just shut up, man. You're not even that old. Like, yeah. why, why are you out of touch already? Get like, understand how, like, I don't get how you don't like reflect and be like, oh, we were like shitty as kids. Like, that's one of them like are, um. I think a lot of everyone's like trying to stand up for the short childhood where they were allowed to say whatever. Um, yeah. But I feel like um, 
if you're older, I get it more. But if you're like our age, if you're like a 90s kid, I think you should, you know, you have more time to like backtrack and accept um, the way things are now. Because, of course, when you were 12, everything seems better because you had no responsibilities yeah. and you just hung out yeah. with your friends. And, and said, well, it's like, what are you romanticizing? The fact that we're being kind of like, um, you know, you're you're being a little homophobic. You're being a little sexist. But yeah. no, we were being we were being funny. It's like, no, you weren't. You were trying to be funny and you weren't you know, like yeah. maybe sometimes you were. But if you were being funny, it wasn't because you were using like inappropriate slang it was maybe because you actually had good time in or something like that but that's what people don't get it's like yeah you can't be funny anymore it's like you need a new definition of what funny is um because yeah. it's like very like limiting anyways quiet on set quite on set yeah. also um so like there's the drake bell stuff um which is the craziest part of it um I think the craziest part about it for me was um, that I, as a kid growing up, um, I looked up to that guy. <laughs> I thought Drake, Drake on Drake and Josh, you know, he's like the cool guy. Yeah. Very, you know, simple. I'm like, oh yeah, I want to be the cool guy, you know, too. I want to like date the girls too. And I, I you know, I, I, and... yeah, I played a little guitar, you know, I was into the type of music Drake made. I, ha I even had like hair similar to Drake. Because everyone had that hair for at one point, you know, like the um, what's crazy about what, you know, the Drake thing is like Drake's like abuse that he suffered was like right before that show that meant a lot to me and a lot of other people began. Um, and so he's like, as he, you know, films this whole show, he's dealing with like this fucked up trauma that he suffered. Um, yeah practically just to get there in order to be a star yeah, yeah i feel really bad for his uh for his dad and that too yeah yeah isn't his dad like a chicago guy oh maybe i forget he might have been wearing like a bears shirt i forgot but he seemed oh, like yeah such I a sweet been, yeah. midwestern guy very like wholesome like humble just he yeah. was really looking out for his son yeah uh, yeah, you just really feel bad for him because everything because he was just going kind of going off like a hunch, and his like it seemed like his just his like gut instinct was giving him bad feelings about whatever, and then and, and I yeah, don't know. He foresaw I, everything basically. Yeah, yeah, and he probably felt a lot of guilt, even though he was definitely trying to do the right thing. And um, yeah, and yeah. well, like yeah, and it's just he was like shut out because of like the priority was uh show business. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I feel like I remember always people saying um, things like, Oh, Drake does like Coke. Now I went to Drake's show and he was clearly on Coke or something like that. Or everyone's perception of Drake, like really changed as he got older. Um, and that like, he, you know, he's like one of those fucked up child stars. And, um, yeah, they go into that uh too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's yeah, it's I don't know how he has ended up now is seemingly better than it could have been. Um I mean, I guess you really don't know what what someone's life is like, but I mean like Amanda Bynes too, like she Yeah, yeah. That's really like tragic story cuz she was just like something else, like a totally yeah. unique like comedy prodigy yeah, at a really yeah. young age and to, to see just how like the adults around her sort of failed her is yeah that's really depressing to see yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah and oh and also i've I, I don't know if i've ever told you this but i once like i once like uh sat next to drake bell at uh um the new beverly theater oh wow which was crazy <laughs> So like I saw, yeah, I was seeing dog day afternoon and I sat next to Drake bell the entire time. Like right next to him. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Did you know, did he like walk in and then you saw him sit down or did no, you no, no, like, like I let, I left the theater with my friend and he told me, you know, the guy you were sitting next to, that was Drake bell. And I was <laughs> so like, so you didn't know until after. Yeah, no, I didn't. But then when I looked back on it, I was like, 
oh shit that totally was like because of the look of him and he also kept like leaving and coming back uh um, huh and maybe i don't know take phone calls or something but yeah that was the craziest thing all right so it seems like uh from us talking like we're maybe from more the like be the nickelode like a different nickelodeon generation because there's like we drift more towards like the beginning um like amanda show drake and josh stuff like that and then there's like the iCarly, the Zoe 101, the Victorious. Um, mm. I do remember I, I like, that's when I, I stopped being into Nickelodeon. Um, yeah. Drake because, and Josh was like the cutoff for me. It was like after that was yeah, done, then yeah. I, that's when I kind of moved on. Yeah. Like I checked into iCarly and I was like, I don't like this. And I, um, I, I didn't watch any of it. Well, I didn't want. No, no, I watched it. Like it was on in the house, but I wasn't like. I would be like, "Oh, I Carly" or something like that. <laughs> um, but I remember like this next phase, not being as much for me, but I do recall like, as a like young dude, probably going through puberty, I couldn't help but notice. I'm like, like the girls are getting like prettier like in these shows maybe like yeah. particularly zoe 101 i think and victorious the girls are wearing like shorter skirts there's like all this like more sexualizing things going on in these shows and and even like bikinis in some scenes yeah too, like so i remember noticing that not really being into these shows for any of the content but just couldn't help but notice that the girls are like just more showy and mm -hmm. i think that's also a reason for say like maybe it helped me get more into nickelodeon just to begin with like not even with like say amanda show and drake and josh was like like there was still like a um a framing of women as like objects a little bit um and i don't know like they showed kids as if they were like adults you know what I mean? It was like yeah. a social scene, the social scene for kids. Like, it, it's funny because like, you, you know, say like you have Cheers, you have the bar, um, you have Seinfeld, Jerry's apartment and the coffee shop and friends, like the different locations of famous iconic sitcoms. And then when these like comedy writers were trying to create these sitcoms for kids, they create all the little random really like the most random hangout spots you can for these kids shows. Um, like Drake and Josh had that like movie theater yeah. and uh, Drake Bell was always going on dates with these girls at the movie theater. Like you would just see them go to the tables to the side to have like a soda and popcorn. Yeah. And they're like, <laughs> they're like having a conversation there. And I remember that happening in like the Disney channel shows too. Cause um well, another thing I wanted to get to was that, like, I felt like Disney was, and I think they'd maybe even talk about this in the doc, but like, Disney was copying Nickelodeon and what they were doing, like, and creating this, like, teen, teeny bopper, like, dating world almost. Um, and I feel like there were shows in Disney that were trying, that were starting to do with what Nickelodeon was doing and make the girls a little more showy. Um, and, I remember like there's all this like dating going on in like Hannah Montana or like Zach and Cody or something like that. And then they're going on these random dates at these like random places. It's like showing kids as if they're adults, but you know, they're still kids. Um, right. You know what I mean? Uh, like a sitcom world for kids is a really bizarre thing due yeah. to the conventions of the genre, I think. Yeah, no, it is really interesting. He's like, yeah, there's so many scenes in Drake and Josh where he's like courting a woman, but it is, it's not like the normal, like awkward high school type of thing. It's very adult like. Yeah, he's yeah. very like in control and confident. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it is kind of bizarre to like look back on that 
Um, and that's like the safe stuff. You know, that's the stuff yeah. that I like. Yeah. We, we had that nobody really bats an eye about has no problem with. Yeah. And, um, yeah, but the, you know, it's just, I guess like, I'm just taught like that next phase of uh, Nickelodeon. It seems like even as a kid, I, I was like noticing that this is like going off the rails a little bit in some fashion. Like it's not connecting with me anymore. And it, and I remember also my sister watching like Zoe 101 or something like that, or, and my parents like watching along and they would like listen to the dialogue and the kids were just sounded like such idiots or just say something so stupid. And my parents being like, all right, you're not watching this show anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, my like criticisms of the documentary are like there's a couple like journalists that are mm -hmm. talking heads in there. Right, right, right. And oh my God, they were just way too like hammy with it. Like just like really act acting like all the former yeah. stars and stuff. They had like real things to say and right and whatever. And these people are like, and then he did this. But yeah. they never did this or this. And it's just like a little too much. Right, like I, right. I don't need them sort of narrating yeah um, yeah they're like they have nothing to do with it they're like because i'm a journalist i'm an expert in how abuse works or something like that it's like they just needed like a host or something like that to a caring yeah. host because it's a sensitive topic and they're just like yeah they're not um organic at all yeah 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 a little too forced i guess Right. Yeah. No, there's um a particular there's actually like a part that's like disgusting with that where it's like I think it's like an episode where it's like after after quiet on set or something like that. And like they yeah. there's a there's like follow up interviews and there's this oh, one yeah. woman who's interviewing Drake Bell about his interview of Quiet on Quiet on Set and she's asking these questions and she's like, So you had to deal with this and and it's just like God, this reporter's so shitty. You know what I mean? Like, I, you could just tell she doesn't give a fuck at all. She's just trying to break this story out there, and then yeah. like that Drake Bell actually went through a lot of shit, and um, he's just doing this because this is his best platform available. But really, he's dealing with the shitty media still. You know, who are just like trying to Exploit rake him. it in. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's still being exploited. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's able to tell his this truth, is... but at least he's exploited. He's still being exploited. Yeah. And that's kind of the thing, too, is like without Drake's story, it's not much of a documentary. Like if it's. Yeah. No, it's really not. He kind of carries it. Yeah. Yeah. And like the Dan Schneider stuff is like weird and bizarre and like seems like a horrible person to be around and work with and especially for, for kids. But yeah. Um, yeah, the the stuff with Drake is like way worse. That actually gives them like a story, and then of course, yeah, like the bulk of the viewing audience now are millennials who grew up with this stuff. So that's so you know they're just making bank on yeah these former child stars like traumas and stuff. Um, so yeah. yeah, they're like they're like licking their chops when they can get Drake to you know, sit down for an interview to talk. Yeah. About this. Yeah. They know it's putting money in their pocket, but yeah. Well, well, yeah. What, what can we, uh, we'll what tra else? We'll transition. We yeah. We'll transition to the also sexually charged, but adult appropriate challengers. Oh yeah. <laughs> Equally horny, but in a more accepting but it, way, but it's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, John, um, because John was always known as the tennis guy in high school. Uh, That's what they called me. Yeah. <laughs> There's the tennis guy, John, walking down the hall. <laughs> no, I was just swinging my racket around, you know. I was walking. so sick. I, I'm so I was so thirsty at the water fountain earlier, but tennis guy John was just slurping away, and he took so long because he's he's training so hard at the tennis. So that's the furthest you went with tennis, right, John? High school? Yeah, I did, I did high school. Um, uh, so you were like a kind of like a failure in your in your household then. I was. I have been since then. I've been estranged from my family, and uh, yeah, you know, I, challengers is pretty. You know, I was like uh, like the one guy 
who I can't remember his name, you know, <laughs> which uh, guy, the guy living in his car, the the guy living in his car. Yeah. That's, I mean, that is, that was essentially me. Yeah, that, yeah. that guy is, um, I will say that's the, uh, I think the more handsome of the two guys in challengers. If oh. I was, um, Zendaya in that movie based off just looks alone, I would probably go for that guy. <laughs> oh man. Wow. Well, if only you were Zendaya in real life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if only I had <laughs> both options, you know, but like, and I was able to create and spark some great iconic tennis match just out of lust from these two hunks, hunky oh, guys. Yeah. yeah. But um, I wanted to ask you, cause I have no tennis experience at all. I've maybe, I think I, like when I was a kid, my parents wanted to play with me and I, it was one of those things where we like, we, he, they would try to get me to play with them and then we'd end up getting like an argument during it and leave because I was too <laughs> impatient to learn how to play tennis correctly. You know what I mean? Um, so I wanted to ask you as someone who is like actually played at a competitive level, um, how accurate chal- the world of challengers is uh, and also just the um, story of challengers is to your experiences in tennis. Cause I, I what I was left the movies thinking is like, is, okay, so is that what it, is this what happens to everybody in tennis? Yeah. I mean, it, it was pretty spot on with uh, uh, it's the most accurate um, sports movie that I've ever seen because tennis is the game of love, you know, and uh, you know, Heard it that's here first, how, everybody. Tennis starts at love. That's that's what you know. The beginning of a, of a match is it's love, love, and so yeah. When basically, you know, if I could, I could take a whole episode to just go in my story, but what led to my? <laughs> You're revealing it here, like Drake, like Drake Bell. <laughs> yes, this, this is, is my story. This is my tennis story. Quiet on game, set, match. Whoa. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> quiet on court. <laughs> Um, yeah, but so, you know, you, you, what led to my failure was you, uh, you have to kind of, um, you have to balance, you get forced into a love triangle. You have to balance uh, these women who it's tail you. It's, you know, you, you get, you, you go with your, uh, you know, your, your partner who's your, you know, your doubles partner. And ultimately there's going to come a woman that comes between you two and, this is where a senior, you know, senior year of high school going into college, I was all ready to like, you know, I felt like my tennis career was just beginning. And, um, and yeah, you know, you, you go through the ringer with, with someone I've since had a falling out with my tennis partner. And, um, you know, one thing leads to another, a little uh, teasing of a menage a trois maybe. And uh, then, and then ultimately, so it's always two men on one woman, John. Like it wasn't two women, and you, you know, ever it, back in those days, that's what it was like. You know, now <laughs> thankfully things are more or have been more accepting. And if only I I got my start in 2024, you know, who could who knows where I'd be right now? I I could be training for Wimbledon as we speak. Um, but uh, yeah, what led me to my demise was. Um, I lost, I lost the match against my, my partner and, you know, tennis is a very, um, yeah. So every time in tennis, you, you have a doubles partner, a woman, like you guys fall in love for this same woman because tennis, you know, there's a lot of women temptation out there apparently. And you, you're, you know, if you don't make it to Wimbledon, you will end up facing your tennis partner in this sort of like, uh, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross fuse match against for this woman basically yeah just yeah you're just drenched in the most amount of sweat that anyone can sweat because of all the sexual tension and competition and you know it's it yeah it's it's really you know it's a a life-changing experience and unfortunately i came on i came out on the wrong side of it and uh um, but yeah it's tennis is such a primitive and animalistic sport you know where this is this decides who makes it it's it's all it's darwinism at its finest you know <laughs> and uh yeah unfortunately uh survival of the fittest and i was the i was not the fittest and uh so yeah i spent a lot of years living in my car after that you know trying to trying to make things work and I, you know I actually this is a pickleball jacket so now i've 
I've had to demote myself to a pickleballer. <laughs> um, oh and, man. Yeah. And, uh, and is there any of, are there any of these, um, sexy love triangles in pickleball? Pickleball. Uh, I, you know, there are still love triangles, but trust me, you want to be as far away from those as possible. <laughs> <laughs> You do not want to get yourself caught in a pickleball love triangle. <laughs> <laughs> this seeing challengers, you know, it reminded me a lot of that, and I it got, it really got me fired up. Um, and I was thinking if I could change anything about tennis now is that with a lot of tennis, especially Wimbledon, which is coming up, there's a lot of like elitism and like you have to be quiet and you have to wear all mm. white and whatever. But uh, I would love if we had some cool tennis matches where the place was just rocking with some Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. <laughs> yeah. Music and people time. are like, dun, 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 dun. Yeah. <laughs> kind of actually like a mix of like uh, Mad Max and challengers where there's yeah, just like yeah. a, there's some guy and a guitar just like shredding away. It's like, it's points. dual concert. The ten the music yes. is first and the tennis is like the background that you're watching yeah totally yeah those matches go for a while right like uh oh my god few, so are they like a few hours long yeah especially yeah like a, a men's match they do best three out of five sets which could be anywhere from like two to four hours probably Jeez. um yeah if i knew john that i wish you had told me in high school that tennis was this sexy because if i had uh, known that i would have dedicated my entire life probably to this sport but you know luca didn't make this movie until now so how how could i know you know yeah that's what now more people are becoming aware of it you know we could have even been you know doubles partners that had to <laughs> i know like what other, a missed you know? opportunity we could have been that yeah. instead of instead of this you know <laughs> like, yeah we have yeah, no it's... we have no we have no like this is not a uh this is something we're just doing organically. We're not doing, there's no like woman off to the side who's trying to like watch and see who um, podcasts better or anything. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's too bad. Maybe podcasting will become as sexy as tennis is. Maybe the show would be better if we had a Zendaya or something like that. Yeah. Like, um, you know, driving us, you know, we had to just say, being like, I someone. just want to see a great podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just bouncing back and forth between our two Zoom screens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone's everyone's watching the Zoom screen. <laughs> and we're just as sweaty too. Just sitting yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. 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 Wearing wearing short shorter shorts and everything. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, uh, I I think one of the top scenes from movies from the year, top moments is Zendaya playing tennis and just going like Come on. that's like one of the <laughs> best scenes from the year oh yeah i mean this is really i mean this and furiosa which i know we'll we'll talk about just like the intensity the non-stop intensity and uh yeah 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 so if you're um if you're you know if you're an adult you might have missed your chance but if you're a kid uh don't forget to sign up for tennis lessons coming up because uh uh I mean, like, why would anyone pass out, pass up on such a a ride as that? Yeah, I heard Dan Schneider is trying to start his own uh, kids tennis club now <laughs> oh, after seeing that. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe like, don't sign up for that one. Sign up. Yeah, for be the... weary. Uh, yeah, do your yeah, research be <laughs> on them. You know, before you jump in. <laughs> the Nickelodeon Challengers Kids Show. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, hopefully that um, that gets canceled before it starts going. So, yeah. Who knows? It could be going in a canyon somewhere in <laughs> Southern California. But anyways, that's Challengers. Um, all right. Uh, Furiosa also came out. I saw that the week after Challengers. Um, and uh, I hear I, I wrote this in my notebook here. Um, it's my takeaway of, overall from Furiosa. I wrote very good. Um, because so I wouldn't forget. Oh, yeah, good. Was, that's uh, a good observation. That's yeah. an honestly, that's just an honest take of what I thought. I thought it was very good. Um, what I wanted to ask you, I wanted us to talk like maybe if you could uh come up with them. I didn't 
give you a briefing so there's no way for you to come up with it on your own <laughs> but i have my top three scenes from furiosa um and here i'll give you mine and maybe you'll yeah, agree yeah, yeah. maybe you'll agree maybe you'll have some different ones mm-hmm. all right so i have the opening the opening of the movie the mother chasing down furiosa she's like trying to snipe the guys it's dark yeah, you got the the dun 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 dun. Oh yeah, you know, and then she keeps like, you know, sl- sl- you know, slowly closing in. She she uh keeps taking parts of the bike and piling, you know, putting it together to make her bike like better. It's like a fucking video game, but in the coolest way. Yeah. Um, and you just also know she's gonna kick their ass. Yeah. Um, and that she's just like superior. I I love that. I love that opening scene. Um, I, I like I felt like the whole theater was like immediately on the edge of their seat um, while that was going on. Um, so that's that's scene number one. Uh, next one is um, I don't really know how to classify this one, it, but like you'll know what I'm talking about. It's uh, like the break into Dementis's like lair with the truck with the war rig. I don't even know if it's that's his lair necessarily. He's like in it's not gas town, but it's in that other place he's in. And the truck kind of goes like into that this circular canyon and he's hiding and meanwhile the truck is just going like oh oh you talking about into... with um it's furiosa and then the guy who's yeah. driving the war yes yeah. yes you know I'm, yeah so that's for sure that's for sure in my top 3 yeah yeah um so there all right that's number 2 and number 3 is the first war war rig scene um where you have all the guys like flying around um it's basically like fury road um in this Mm -hmm. basically so yeah yeah okay well those last two are for sure in my top three because the one the one i immediately thought of was that first time they're driving the war rig um yeah and the guys are like they have like their parachutes yeah like oh my god it's so it's so sick yeah it's just amazing it's just amazingly constructed yeah so yeah i'd say that and then then when they yeah they infiltrate uh dementis is uh i think he's at the bullet farm uh there I you go see i needed yeah, those like there we go locations yeah. classifications is uh, it there's only so many places in there's the like figurative. three four yeah. places yeah yeah maybe I'll, this will be my third one i'll throw out there's when um dementis and his crew uh first reach the citadel um, yeah 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 just sort of like the it felt so like monumental like mm-hmm. getting to the citadel and this is where you know a lot of like sequels and reboots are like oh remember this thing you know right, remember right, the right. death star or stuff mm-hmm. like that but this is like getting to the citadel and seeing like Immortan joe and mm-hmm. um and just like yeah this like meeting between the two it felt so like grandiose that yeah um, yeah yeah that was probably that's probably up there too it's wild to like um in this to see a Morton Joe and you're actually like, hey, this guy's like smarter than like Dementis, you know what I mean? So he's like actually yeah. like a uh you know, he has a lot of he's actually like kind of like a smart guy, even when yeah, there's right. no way yeah. in Fury Road to like look at him like that. Um yeah. yeah. I get all right. So then I wanted to ask, all right, who would you rather ride with? You Morton Joe or Dementis? See, that's where I feel like, um, like you just said, like a Morton Joe, he seems like smarter. Like Dementis, I think, would be a little bit too much of a loose cannon. Mm. Like how when they're uh, they're going into, I think it's Gas Town, and he's having those guys like, you know, look, try to, you know, make themselves yeah, like yeah. Um, the war boys. I think that's what they're called. Um, yeah, yeah. He has them paint themselves. But it's just kind of to like sacrifice them uh, in a way. And so, yeah, I feel like Immortan Joe, uh, while he, of course, sacrifices those war boys too, <laughs> I feel but like you, he might be a little bit more. At least you predictable. could be the real war boy. And then you uh, you get to like go fully into the like, you know, the, allu- the illusion of it. And yes, <laughs> like yeah. Believing you'll be in Valhalla or whatever. And at least the Morton Joe does actually care. Like he really cares about his like, especially in Fury Road, you see, like he cares about his kids. Like he 
the pregnant women he's like those are that's my child you know like he cares yeah. about something at least where yeah. dementis doesn't really seem like he cares about anything mm. um which they're both just like awful but i, I would probably <laughs> pick a morton joe you know yeah i don't know if i could actually go full war boy that's the thing like yeah I, I don't think i could live in ignorance like that you know i think i would uh and plus dementis has these great speeches you know that's true he's, the he's most a little bit funnier yeah. yeah he's funny he's the most talkative guy in there i mean either way you're probably more likely to die um but also like look at i don't know it's like some of the things those war boys have to do up in the citadel like oh it's just terrifying you know like they gotta like <laughs> like when the I don't even know the cars are like falling or some shit. The truck is falling. They're all like repairing it or. God, yeah. I mean, yeah. And then if more and Joe like picked me and like to like jump off the Citadel, I would probably not do it. And I'd probably be executed anyway. <laughs> hey, that's you, you bring up a good point. You might, you might be more, you know, with Dementis, it seems like you're more like an independent contractor yeah exactly like a freelance exactly. uh mercenary <laughs> type guy. yeah i might fit in more there you know in gas town <laughs> yeah i but, but i guess yeah the the thing is with the morton joe you think you know maybe if you get in good with him you could get some uh some cabbage you know some good veggies <laughs> that they got yeah yeah the there's a lot of life and... in there yeah the citadel is like outside of the green place the um you would be in the uh I don't know. Uh, like it's like the Garden of Eden in a way of Mad Max or how, whatever yeah. you want to call it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. And then, all right. Next thing I wanted to ask you. All right. If you're going to design your own, you know, truck, you know, vehicle in Mad Max, what would yours look like? Oh, yeah. That's a really great question. That's probably the, that's the hardest of all three of these questions. <laughs> <laughs> Because I am definitely, I'm definitely not like a like a car guy. Oh no, me neither, John. Don't this worry. This is like, but when I but when I watch something like Fury Road or Furiosa, I'm like, hell yeah, that's yeah, that's cool. yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't. There's no Teslas in Fury Road, so it has to be gas fueled you know, automobile. So honestly, I would probably be something kind of like a monster truck type thing, kind of like more like what Dementis drives um when they're like chasing after uh, yeah. furiosa well those trucks that can like just you know, go over any terrain they can just they like want. crush everything yeah. yeah um that i would probably go with something like that yeah so i'd probably have some some sick monster truck with some like huge spikes sticking out the back mm. uh you know and uh and maybe a sunroof too yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you gotta get extra sun when you're out there in the desert sunroof anyways. leather seats and uh <laughs> and some good cup holders you know i have to have some good cup holders in there too dolby sound system oh my god i have sick sound system and then maybe uh i, I would have a good i'd want to have a good tv too not for watching stuff but a, a, for, i need a backup camera you know if I'm in, <laughs> the backup camera on the fury road yeah if i'm in that big of a car or it's kind of, it's probably hard to see like what's behind you i need a good like hd backup camera um so that yeah that that's probably what the interior would be like you know and then of course i'd have the i'd have dice hanging from the rear view mirror too um, yeah <laughs> a disco ball yeah yeah a disco ball yeah I'm going to go with a bit of a curveball here, John, because my Kia Forte 2017 SE, I don't even remember if that's what Whoa. it is. That this car, John, has been very much holding up well for me lately. Knock on wood. I would say it's a beast almost as I drive it wherever I want around Los Angeles, up hills, down hills on the 101 on the 405 <laughs> on the 170 south um, Take it down I've, to sunset. Taken, mm. I've taken it to death valley california and i've driven it up a gravel road wow. i've taken it everywhere so why not bring the kia forte to the fury road but i would have of course uh some modifications um the roof 
gone. No need. You know, we're going full convertible, convertible. Wow. Uh, Kia Forte. And it's a hatchback. So, you know, the amount of space I can have, because like, you know, you need to have all your stuff live on the road. Um, but then what I would do is I would modify it so that my um, John, you know, I make I make uh, I have a beat laboratory, right? Of course. Um, I'm currently podcasting from my beat laboratory. I turn it into my podcast laboratory, but I would bring my beat laboratory and modify it on the vehicle so that. I will, it will be driving, but like the guitar guy, I will be, you know, beat labbing as the oh, car is going. Yeah. And that way, like Dementis has some nice, like rap beats to like, you know, more there Joe has go. like the guitar solos. Dementis would have the rap, the rap beats going from my Kia Forte. That You just made yourself invaluable to the team. You know, you can't. Yeah. The the guitar guy is not, you know, he's not getting attacked or anything because yeah, he's we're irreplaceable. Valuable. Yeah, no one ever attacks. Well, actually, does he? I don't remember. Yeah, does Tom know, Hardy attack the guitar guy and I don't know. Hero? He might, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you'll <laughs> shoot him in the head. Yeah. You know, you gotta make in these scenarios, you gotta make yourself invaluable to the team. And that's yeah, it. I mean, you know, there's nobody else that could do that. So yeah, guitar guy is like one the one true artist of Fury Road, if you think about it, like because unless you'd want to consider driving a war rig an art form i'm not sure that that's up to you know up to you but i think the one true of the old world that we live in now that guitar guy is the one guy who is living his dream um in the the mad max universe so i'd like to bring my uh passion for making beats to uh Demetis's crew on the fury on the fury road in like a another sequel or whatever we'll have someone who's like uh they have a 1980s like stand-up comic beyond <laughs> <laughs> doing bits about observational humor about uh, what's going on <laughs> look at the wall rig move that's like what my mom was saying to me when I was just... <laughs> what's the deal with valhalla <laughs> is it real is it not real <laughs> All right, so now I'll transition into uh, the Fall Guy. Um, big blockbuster movie about stuntmen with Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt. I went to, to the theater to see this, John. Did you go well, to the theater to see this? I, I didn't. I, I did not go to the theater to see it, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, and I feel like I really missed out on what could have been the movie of the spring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know there was a ton of hype about it too. You know that I saw SNL when Gosling was on there, and they were, and they teased the Fall Guy there. So much promotion, but I, I missed out on it. Yeah, that I, promotion really <laughs> struck at you on yeah. SNL. You know, the entire time it was in theaters, I actually. I just had a lot going on in my life, you know. Um, it, it just so happened to line up with my niece's, um, uh, it's called like, like Quinceañ Mitzvah. Um, she's, it was, you know, a combined Quinceañera bar bat mitzvah uh, that went on, you know, and these things, uh, you know, they last, um, well, about how long, a, you know, how long is a movie in theaters? You know, three How to long? four weeks. <laughs> it's about that long. And, uh, and it, it lined just, up perfectly with the release of The Fall Guy. Wow. It lined up perfectly. And, uh, you know, these are really important family things. It's more important than a funeral or a wedding. You know, these things only happen every so often. And it took a whole month off of work. And, uh, and yeah, I'd, unfortunately, you know, I was trying. I was like, can we, is there any way I can, like, get out for just, like, a day so I can go see The Fall Guy? And, uh, and I just saw the look of disappointment on her face. And so I, I, it was like, okay, you know, this, I'll, I'll see it. I'll catch it when it's streaming or something, you know, and Luke, I know Luke will fill me in on it because he'll go to the theater. He'll be my boots on the ground. That'll see it. Um, I, so, no, yeah. I, I don't have a party to attend for a few hours, much less a month. That is something I know nothing about. Yeah. I mean, it's just you know, it's a it's a family thing. Uh, I'm all I'm a big family guy. I'm all about family. So, <laughs> you know, I, I had to I had to be there to support, 
And, and what uh, if de- what a family you have that like you guys get together for that long? Like yeah, a month. it's yeah, it's really uh, it's intensive and passionate. Yeah, we're a very it's intensive and passionate. Yeah, <laughs> I will tell you, John. I know you were like in there and all you were trying not to check your phone for updates about the Fall Guy. Yeah. Um, um, I will say the Fall Guy is just okay, you know. So I think it's cool. like uh. It's okay that you missed it. Um, unfortunately, it's not like Oppenheimer or something like that where you're going to be able to, it'll be in theaters long enough. If something like a Kisan mitzvah comes up, Oppenheimer, you'll be able to see fine. Um, uh, but no, yeah. the fall guy's in and out. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on <laughs> to... Uh, Checking along. Moving on to uh, Hitman, the Netflix film. Uh, John, did you see Hitman? I, I watched Hitman on Netflix at home. No, I uh, I didn't. Um, yeah, I, I didn't. I missed this one too. Uh, and uh, yeah, this one. I, <laughs> <laughs> this one, I was actually, I had jury duty. Uh, and uh, so I was out for, for a really long time and uh yeah it was just a really it was a big case you might have heard about it in the media which is why i uh you know i was sequestered so i couldn't i was like oh my god if this had to line up with when hitman comes out on netflix <laughs> and uh so you guys didn't have access to netflix while you're sequestered there no because you know with how netflix is you know they're updated with true crime stuff so consistently you know they oh, thought, it would influence the decision the verdict what, right right what if they come out with a true crime case about what's going on in this Man. trial already yeah. on netflix so we yeah we didn't get that all we got was were books um and stuff so you know i i read dante's inferno while um sequestered for jury duty um yeah i mean you, there's no way hitman's not based off a book so you couldn't even like read the book first you know you have no yeah. way of um even prepping yourself for hitman yeah otherwise i could have i maybe could have been up to date and like and ready for it but uh well, yeah but the case like, is over now john like was it over when is it when was it over you know so it was it, it, i just got out this morning we just all right so you should be able to watch it like right after the broadcast then all right yeah, I, I literally I walked from the courtroom to my to my door here and uh, started podcasting right he's away. He's a busy so, he's a busy man, everybody. He's I, a busy yeah, man. I yeah, and people are talking about this debate. I had no idea there was a, a debate going on. You know, I <laughs> was so cut off from the outside world. I just found out that Bronny James got drafted uh, too. You know, uh, I didn't, you didn't even know LeBron was was married. Because of this, all this stuff you have going on. Wait, what? Yeah, it was just a you know a big case. Um, but uh, so yeah, I missed out on Hitman, unfortunately. Um, but again, right, well, I was well, like, here's Luke will say. fill me in. I know. Well, here's yeah. what I'll say: Hitman's pretty good, you know. And I will say oh. that the fact that you didn't watch it yet, you have missed out, but you haven't totally because it's still on Netflix. You know, you didn't totally drop the ball like with Fall Guy. Hitman wow. is still available to you, and you can watch it right after this. Uh, you just stay right where you are in that chair. I'm not gonna and, move. Yeah, and and just turn on Netflix and pop it on because it's pretty good. It's a it's a movie about lying, um, something we all you know know a lot about. A movie about acting, deception, illusion, and just a fresh take on the hitman genre. And uh, how could you pass up on a Glenn Powell, Richard Linklater joint? Unless you're like John and you have, uh, I didn't have jury duty, so. I watched Hitman instead. So yeah, I'm excited to I'm excited to see it. Glenn Powell, you know, he's he's Hitman, but he is actually the new It Man in movies right now. So Ooh, I'm not sure anyone said that yet. Yeah, that was that's a first. It's an exclusive uh, here <laughs> on the podcast. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I'm excited, and I think it's cool that uh, that Glenn Powell is this like hunky guy, and he's doing. Yeah, he looks kind of just in the promo shots and everything. He looks like he's kind of being a weirdo, a little bit in this. Yeah, almost. He's almost like, uh, say, if he like try to. Yeah, he's like hipstering it up a little bit, like mm. Texas, Texas hipster thing. He's he's mm-hmm. doing so. It's, it's cool. It's very different from, say, like anyone but you. You know, which. Yeah. Uh, all right. So speaking of things that are going on in the world lately, um, 
probably the biggest thing that's been going on in my life is that JJ Redick was uh, hired as coach of the LA Lakers. Wow. It's yeah. uh, I can't really think of much else. I don't have really room in my brain. It's like eat, sleep, you know, Oh, what's JJ Redick going to do as coach of the Lakers? You know, um, we all know J we all know JJ Redick. Like, uh, he was three point king, man. He played for the Clippers. Uh, magic. Yeah, magic. Uh, Sixers, Pelicans. You know, he never won anything, but he was always there. You know, he was always mm-hmm. there. And then, then he becomes like a podcaster, like most NBA players. And something different about JJ Reddick's podcast from. Other NBA podcasts is like JJ Redick, if you don't notice, is actually like pretty smart. Smarter than uh smarter than most NBA players, I would say. <laughs> and... <laughs> and he wants you to know it. Yeah. And he wants you to know it. He's very <laughs> he doesn't give a fuck this guy. And um, as you know, John, I love ESPN first take. Um I am a yes. fairly regular watcher of it. And he was also on first take for a while. And it was crazy to watch him go at like Stephen A. Smith and like uh, Kendrick Perkins, like these loud mouth African-American guys. And J.J. Reddick's this little white guy from Duke who's just like telling them how it is, you know? Nerd, um, yeah. And, and winning the debates, you know, in a way. But like... Um, you know, like bringing up points in a very, you know, sophisticated way and also just using his NBA experience uh, as leverage. And then he does the broadcasting. Uh, you know, he's good. And I thought he was good with uh, Mike Breen and Doris Burke. Like, I thought that was like yeah. a really good trio, you know? I liked um, when he was with uh, Richard Jefferson, too. Yeah, I forget who I forget who the third was with them, but there was a few games where like they were the two, like Mark Jones or whatever. Mark, yeah, Jones. that might be yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I, I thought he was really good. Like I was not like during the finals being like, oh, we've downgraded our broadcasting team. You know, mm-hmm. even though I missed those guys who did it for years and years and years. Like I didn't think it was like a downgrade because I think Doris Burke and JJ Redick are both very good. Now though. The, that big blabbermouth has managed to weasel his way in to coach of the LA Lakers. Oh, and not to mention the big podcast he did with uh, LeBron James. Uh, he got LeBron to do a podcast. He got LeBron to speak outside of a controlled media zone. Um, I don't know. Did you watch mind the game at all, John? I just saw clips, um, but I never watched like a full episode. Um, I feel like they only did like three or four episodes before, before, before the, like it was over, didn't they? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Well, I haven't like, kept up with maybe like five or six. Oh. It's okay. Jury duty. I was busy. And, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I watched the full episodes and I enjoyed it a lot. Um, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> You kind of learn little things like, uh, ooh, like LeBron will be like, when we run an when we run an up down at the nail, like it's very technical about basketball, yeah. and I'm like, oh, oh shit, that's I how thought the, about that. That's how the the spread pick and roll for Golden State is unstoppable. Just things mm-hmm. like things like that, you know, mm-hmm. very deep into basketball strategy for like a professional player. So definitely very valuable information to me as a. <laughs> but JJ Reddick has no coaching experience, John. You know, like what the fuck? You know, this is unprecedented, right? Now he's head yeah. coach, one of the most celebrated sports teams ever. You know? So what I'm seeing is that this strategy can be applicable to other um to other like you know media members or podcasters or you know guys like guys who are in our position you know and so we've been here we've been talking all things movies 
for like, you know, five to six years now, right? Yeah. And and you heard my review of Furiosa. Like, I mean, pretty good. Mm-hmm. I mean, was you know I not talking about was I not spot on like or or you know? Like I I'm I mean you you impress me every every day still with your your takes and knowledge and intellect. Right, so uh, right. And who yeah. could break down that Star Wars movie uh better than we did uh last month? You know what I mean? Like who could have I as I was talking with you, I was like, no one follows the mise en scène quite like John. No one knows how to break it down. Like uh you're almost like uh you know, on uh, uh, on Sports Center, there's that guy Tim Legler. You're almost like the Tim Legler of movie commentary guys. Wow, I mean that is uh, that's high praise. I can't. Um, I'm I'm at a loss for words. That is that's that's nice to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I'm thinking is like, while I love this podcast probably more than anything in the world, we use this now as leverage to become. Hollywood film directors, because we know there are, you know, seats to fill in those jobs. That is a job that that is a job market that is in high demand right Mm -hmm. now. You know, there's not enough people who want to be directors, writers, um, actors, especially out here in in, like where I live in Los Angeles. There's like most people you meet are like, you know, farmers, landscapers, like stuff like that. There's not enough people who want to direct, you know, really have the pressure of the hot seat. Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking is we show, we use this to show that we could direct, you know, a blank check, hundred million dollar project, you know, like yeah. maybe Disney is hiring for the, a new star Wars thing. Well, yeah, that's why I think people are now starting to realize the important role that podcasters play in in the professional world here. And I think this JJ Reddick hire has just opened the floodgates, um, and they're they're realizing what we could, you know, potentially bring podcasters into doing. Uh, and so, yeah, I think it's just a natural. There's this natural pipeline that has started um, from podcasting to. Uh, to directing or coaching and so yeah i think yeah. We, we could really change the game and bring our analytical intellectual minds to directing this i mean just give us a blank check and we'll turn it into gold i mean that's yeah. talking about it is more important than being able to do it as we've seen from jj reddick uh if you're able to talk about it that is enough i mean anyone can just do it. I mean, anyone could really just do it, but can you really talk about it and then go on to do it? I don't, it's, you know, that's just, it takes a different sort of skill set, a different mind, um, and just a different way of looking at things, which I think, um, yeah, I know JJ Reddick, he's kind of like the, the uh, blueprint for this moving yeah. forward. So, right. um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to whatever the future holds. Um, and I know I'm going to keep my phone on loud. Keep your, yeah, keep your so phone I, ready. Yeah. So I and, don't miss those calls when they come in. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I and I'm very excited about the possibilities because there seems to be, we're in a very big transition point in this film industry right now. Like we have Quentin Tarantino is making his final film. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola also, you know, he's how much longer is he going to live? Uh, maybe Martin Scorsese, what Scorsese as well. We, there's only like a few more movies left. Um, so I feel like the door is opening for podcasters to fill those jobs. Um, so I don't know if you say we were to get this opportunity, well, would you prefer the Coppola job or the Tarantino job more? You know, I, I'm. I'm taking the Coppola job. When I see myself as a podcaster, I see myself as someone who really isn't afraid to, you know, get get deep in the trenches and go go to the Philippines and Cambodia and make uh make a movie. You know, I I could see myself making the next um, you know, Mr. Bean movie, uh, but in like war-torn uh 
a war-torn country. You know, I could go to uh, the Dem Democratic Republic of Congo and film the new Mr. Bean movie and, and that can channel Coppola, you know, and I just really what think... What a better location for that movie. That's where I think, you know, and, that, and that's where, you know, being a podcaster just gives you this different frame of reference to think of things like this, you know, that who right. else would have thought of something like right. this? Right. So I really think, you know, um, when you watch something like, like uh, Heart of Darkness or Hearts of Darkness, um, uh, you know, it's just, you can just really tie it back into what we do with this show here. And uh, yeah, and I, saw myself, I, I, take, I saw myself, I saw myself on Zoom, you know, when I looked through deep through the heart of darkness, I saw myself here, you know, putting everything because I put like these directors like Coppola did with his house, his kids his and especially his soul. I put all that on the line every day when I do this show. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're speaking of cars earlier, you know, I'm not afraid to uh you know to sell my car in order to to get enough budget to make my films you know i <laughs> i'm willing to do things like that to sell my valuable assets um you know to make art yeah what was i gonna fucking say else about it? <laughs> well what what would you uh you know what 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 job you know jobs on the market in this director world are like appealing to you you know is it the, Cop the you know are we going to be competing for the coppola job is there tarantino or scorsese you know scorsese you, who knows how much longer he can he can keep this up i mean i yeah. want to take over the mob movies of scorsese if i had to pick perfectly i think the tarantino job is appealing but um also, all these guys, I mean, they're older, right? We're young bucks, you know, full of energy, full. We have the, so much we energy. have the capacity, so much energy. We, <laughs> <laughs> we have the capacity to drink, you know, six yerba mates in a day, if you want. Like I, we could easily make, uh, yeah. we could make a feature film with the amount of yerba mates we drink. So these guys can't drink yerba mate anymore it would kill them they should be in our position here um you know doing the doing a podcast about movies um it should be i think reversed yeah, yeah. and so you know maybe if you know we were to take Co the coppola job or the tarantino job both both of those guys would be down to like sit in uh this seat um you know and uh you know they might lose they might lose our following um a little bit but because we would be doing their jobs but um you know i think that's more the environment that's more suited to their uh capabilities right now as old old men as we saw with uh trump and biden you know they we we need young people in positions of power uh yeah i'm keeping my emails open uh my my phone lines open yeah, my, my my dms i'm checking every DMs every open. five minutes at least yeah and i'm sure you know once we get off here um they'll really start to come in so you know we'll need to take some time I, to really and i know eventually it's not going to be just an only fans person dming me it's going to be a uh it's going to be like a head of uh head of warner brothers you know being like yeah. hey i heard the podcast you know uh we wouldn't have been able to do this before but because of uh you know what rob palinka and genie bus did you know now we movie studios are we have the power um to hire people like you uh so it's yeah. really what we've been waiting for um from the very beginning i would say yeah, it was the goal all along, I think. And, you know, I think it's really coming to fruition now. So, yeah, I'm just looking ahead to uh, to this next phase. Yeah, um, and so it's, I, it's not about, I know people are going to say this, the critics, right? But it's it's not about the money. It's, um, yeah. it's about yeah. the ability to change the world with the cinematic art form. The money is just like, like just a bonus, you know, like maybe I'll use that money to move from my like one bedroom apartment to like a house, like in the Hills on Laurel Canyon or something like that. Um, 
-hmm. but that's not what it's about. Um, that's not what it's about. Yeah. I mean, I'll probably use it and I'll finally get, uh, my yacht and private jet and, uh, and a couple of houses and stuff, but I, that's not really not what I'm like thinking right. about all that yeah, much. No, you know? no, not at all. I'll probably just get like, you know, penthouse in Manhattan, uh, you know, maybe like uh, midtown, you know, right? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. that's the place to be. You're around everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, close to the park as well, because I like I, you got to walk right in the park. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when winter comes, I go to my um, house in Malibu california and that's that would be the setup um you know but it wouldn't be much but the point is like i'm directing feature films now yeah. instead you don't need a lot you're not a materialistic guy you don't no need no all no. these like you know grandiose things yeah yeah it's no. all about like in art. new york yeah. i wouldn't even own a car like uh, in la of course i would own probably like five or six cars yeah at least um, yeah of, of like all varying you know size and you know, luxury, you know, the, the best of the best. Cause you know, why wouldn't you? Right. Uh, yeah. But New York, I would walk around like with the common folks, you know? Yeah. You'd be just one of the, one of the people. That's <laughs> and that, uh, do you want to do the comedy specials now that you want to talk yes. about? We are, we are going to end. Uh, this is what the, this episode has been leading up to this whole time. <laughs> this is all me talking up. about these comedy <laughs> specials on YouTube. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah we got i mean we've talking we're talking about new relevant stuff let me even pop for this segment i'll pop this other airpod in um whoa now you know i'm getting serious um and you know are if you're like me are, are you getting a little you're 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 looking for a little rejuvenation and the, the comedy you consume and you know, it's like, okay, yes, there's a guy on stage holding a microphone. He's talking about real life stuff and whatever. But what if I told you that there are, there's a corner of the internet where you can find <laughs> some guys that are doing some different stuff with comedy. <laughs> mm. And uh, then, yeah, so I wanted to, wanted to highlight these. Um, uh, in particular, there's, I'll, the one I'll start off with. These are all kind of, you know, I've talked a little bit about Joe Para um, before too. I think he was on my like end of the year list, his special that came out last year. Um, and these guys are all kind of in that same world. Um, and the first one is Connor O'Malley's uh, Stand Up Solutions. Uh, you There's know what? A stand Up I like? special about stand up? Not really. No. So it's. <laughs> <laughs> he's kind of like all of all of all I'm going to bring up three specials and these are all like character based and I can't uh, really say yeah. too much about them because it's really it hard. gives to it all away. Yeah, it's really hard to explain even. But uh, <laughs> what are, <yeah>. are these? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so Anna O'Malley in this stand up solution special, he's um, sort of this businessman entrepreneur type pitching you on. Oh. this new way of comedy uh and it is oh. really obscure and bizarre and he also did a whole like instagram live thing after the fact um about it that kind of ties into the special and it's kind of this whole demented world that he lives in uh where you find this character and uh yeah it's it's a very very strange and bizarre and it, it ties into this character's like personal life too and, and some very silly ways so that's the first one the next one is uh dan lakata for the boys um now dan lakata he was also a writer on joe para talks with you um and uh he's i think he's childhood friends with with him as well but dan lakata did this stand-up special in um at his old high school in front of wow the audience was in his old high school auditorium in front of 15 year old boys. And, uh, and it's, and he's legitimately doing it there. And it's so funny to see, like, you know, when you watch a special, you're like anticipating a comedian doing jokes to an audience that is like laughing and enjoying it. And these kids definitely do, but there's a lot of like, uh, stuff they don't get. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff they don't get. And I've never laughed more at jokes 
not landing with a, with an audience. That's kind of like uh, the point, basically. It's kind of yeah, he, and he's doing a character too. Like he's you know, he's he's telling these stories, but he, it's obviously they're not his actual. It's not about his actual life. So yeah, that one's really great. And there's some moments too where the kids are like in on it, and they there would be like a round of applause for something he says, and uh, um, it's really funny. And there's like little vignettes in between his jokes where he's like giving life advice to these kids, but these kids are clearly know he's like he seems like this like 35 year old loser that's trying to give them advice <laughs> on life. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, good, man. Yeah, that, yeah, that sounds great. It's hilarious. Yeah, I, it's so Dan Licata for the boys. Yeah, these are all on YouTube again too, so they're very easily accessible. And then the last one, it's Brad Howe, uh, live at the Legion, and it's this. He's also doing this sort of like sort of blue collar type uh stand-up comedian from the 80s but in today's oh. day and age and he's doing it at like oh and and like this is at the brooklyn american legion and i don't know do you know like about like american legions at all no they're kind of like uh i didn't know they would actually have them in like brooklyn and stuff but and like every small town in the midwest has like an american legion where it's like maybe it's like the veterans of the area like kind of put it on volunteer and there's different events that go on or things for the community that happen in these places uh and it's a very like small town thing um and so it's like this old building with like wood paneling and stuff and yeah he's just doing this like gen x so he's like doing the type of character for the people that would like it yes basically. for the people yeah. that would be in this sort yeah. of yeah um, but it's all it's very like i don't know ridiculous and offensive i i wouldn't i wouldn't even say it's offensive it's kind of it's just silly like wow. it's really it's really silly and he even says like there's just a disclaimer in the beginning that's like this comedy special has no jokes um, <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just really it's just really weird and silly and goofy and that's kind of the whole point of it so yeah that's Brad Howe live at the legion nice. um yeah and so I like those stand are, up those with a twist, you know. Uh, yeah, like uh, stand up for drummers by Fred Armisen. Yes. I really like. Yeah, uh, yes. I think that stand up should be directed more for like, okay, this is we're gonna specialize in this, and for the people who like really will get the jokes, you know. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's not they're not like straightforward comedy specials where it's like the same. You know, you kind of once you see a lot of comedy specials, you kind of can start to see like the formula that some of these guys have, but these ones are all um, very specific to each of these comedians and like the characters they're kind of doing. And, uh, and yeah, it's just a, a different, something completely different that um, is like a breath of fresh air. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I've actually always thought like stand up for cinephiles is what would be like a good idea, you know? Yeah. All right. Well, that's bringing us to a close for today, but I wanted, uh, I have, but wait, Oh, there's, <laughs> there's more. one more. Um, John, as you know, I love more, more than anything, almost outside of doing this show, which I love doing more than anything. The thing I love the most after that would be poetry. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I love You've always poetry. been a poet. Yeah. 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 And then after that, it's pizza and then probably like my dog and then my girlfriend, and then my family. Yeah. The, the, you're starting with the three P's, though podcasting, <laughs> pizza, and poetry. <laughs> That's all I need, you know? Yeah. Really. <laughs> yeah. I love poetry. <laughs> I've, 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 I have, uh, some of my favorite poets would be, uh, uh, Whitman, Ginsburg, Bob Dylan. You know, I know no one's ever said this before, John, but like Bob Dylan was not just a musician. He was a poet. But no wow. one gives him credit for his like lyrics. They just give him credit for his like music. Yeah, I never really thought about it. Everybody compliments his voice and how like classically trained he has been not about like the the lyrics and the songwriting yeah, yeah. Uh, no but like what i what I, I listen 
I don't listen to Dylan the same way as maybe you do, John, or you like or other people do. I I'm listen to the average guy that you yeah, know, just, right? You know, exactly. Like... That's what I'm saying. And I listen to the lyrics because I I break it down. All right. So I wrote this poem. Um the following poem. I wrote it for you, John, because um I love doing wow. this show with you so much. All right. Wow. And if and if you like it, maybe I'll write you more poems. Um, but for, let, for now, let's just start yeah. with one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's great. All right. So now, now remember, focus on the focus on the words. All right. That's yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Oh, please believe me. I'd hate to miss the train. Oh yeah. And if you leave me, I won't be late again. Oh no, all these years I've been wandering around, wondering how come nobody told me all that I was looking for was somebody who looked like you. Wow. You wrote that? Yeah, yeah, I, wow. I wrote it, yeah. I've got a feeling that that's the best poem I may have ever heard. I, oh, you've got a feeling? Oh, we I've... both got a feeling. Wow, yeah, that was I had a feeling wow. deep inside, John. You know, and it's time I be recognized for the true poem poet wow. po poet I am. I mean, everybody had a had a hard year, and I think that <laughs> is the type of thing that people need to hear now is is poetry like that. Yeah. Um, everybody had a good time though, too. Every, everybody had a good time. That too. Everybody had a had a wet dream, and uh, gotta let their yeah. hair down too. Yeah, yeah see, like, see that, John. Like, look at what my words brought out in you. Wow, uh, I am, it, I'm just aghast. Right if I now. could, if 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 I can bring that out of you just from my uh, words, it shows that I should just, um, you know, I should keep doing this thing. I mean, yes, this is. I mean, I. I don't really show emotion all that easily. And you really brought it out of me right now that I'm. It's all right, John. That's why you have a wife to hug and, and cry on her shoulder, you know? Yeah. And now I, I think I'm going to curl up and, and watch Hitman and uh, just reflect <laughs> on the words that <laughs> you've blessed me with on this day. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, it sounds like. It sounds like there will be a new poem at the end of every Cinnabums episode. Wow. So everyone stay tuned. Uh, you've been listening to the Cinnabums podcast with Luke and John. Everybody have a great day and a great week. Peace be and with you. Yeah. <laughs> Peace be with you. <laughs>